good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. Um, on behalf of the organizers, uh, Roya, Adriana, Emin, and myself, I'd like to welcome you to our third net zero emissions workshop, virtual workshop. So as introduction, I'd like to say that globally, there is an accepted need to address the challenges of increasing greenhouse gas emissions that pose a global risk to climate change and environmental degradation. As part of a global initiative, the EU has defined uh, key targets that will ensure net zero CO2 by the year 2050. The adopted roadmap known as the European Green Deal will provide for the following key points. Net zero emissions of greenhouse gases by the year 2050, economic growth decoupled from resource use, and no person and no place left behind. Subject of today's webinar and workshop is uh, carbon capture and storage or CCS. And these initiatives are one of the key activities to support these EU New Green Deal targets and ensure transformation to a net zero emission driven economy. Government, industry and academia have joined throughout the world into consortiums to address CO2 emissions using geosciences, engineering, uh, to help solve this multifaceted international challenge. This workshop program has been divided into two days with three sessions. We begin today with our SEG, SEG President's message uh, from Ken Talbany, followed by the technical part of the workshop and continue with a keynote overview on the challenges and the solutions ahead for CCS. Today's session is dedicated to CO2 monitoring and examines several different perspectives from the EU, but also Japan, and a modeling study by the SEG SEAM uh, CO2 project. Day two, We'll focus on insights and risks for CO2 transport and storage infrastructure. The second session of day two will address the business context of CCS uh, with a full supply chain activities and regulatory viewpoint and recommendations. And with that, I hand you over to our SEG president, uh, Ken Talbin, for his uh, welcome message. Thank you, Ken. Thanks, Anthony. Happy to be here. And uh... I'm really excited to see this workshop and I wanna point out how this workshop kind of hits all the buttons for SEG. We have three overriding messages. What can we do for members? What can we do for the science? And what can we do for the society at large? And of course, this hits all of those. Clearly what it does for the society, Anthony just laid out, uh, our members need to help with this energy transition and all the things going on with climate change. And so this provides information and the science advancement that's necessary. We also have a couple of other things going on. Our membership needs to be much younger and much more global than it has been in the past. If you've looked at some of the things we've sent out, SEG has a core of membership who unfortunately are more like me, uh, quite a bit older, uh, quite a bit more in Houston. And we are very much trying to change that. So again, this workshop uh, points towards European participation. And I would say more than participation, I think Europe is actually leading in this CCS space uh, way more than, uh, than the US and North America. So it's really good to see you taking the lead and participating and actively uh, pushing these things forward. It's, it's really the kind of thing SEG needs. And it looks like a terrific program. I like seeing the SEAM participation and uh, the other presentation on what's going on in Japan and around the world, it, it does show the global nature of our activities and our science and really what we can do to contribute. So thank you very much for organizing. Looks to be a great couple of days. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. So we're a little bit ahead of schedule, um, but I think we can uh, jump straight into the first, first talk. Uh, our first uh, presentation will be from Philip Ringrose from Equinor, uh, covering the subject of carbon capture, and storage challenges and solutions ahead. If you will, please, Philip. Thank you so much, Anthony. Um, let me just share my screen and check that the uh, video and voice is working. <laughs> so just gonna check in here. Uh -huh. A little bit a minute, there we go. Do you see a full screen? Okay, well, thank you, uh, SEG, for the invitation to this talk. Uh, you gave me a challenging demand. <laughs> Um, you gave me the title, Challenges and Solutions Ahead. <laughs> so what I will actually talk about is a little bit on the CCS climate challenge. 
And then I'll switch to smart solutions for CO2 storage. I, for example, I won't look at solutions for carbon capture. <laughs> um, so uh, to put it in really big context, and it was nice that you mentioned the EU Green Deal and what's happening in the United States right now and, 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 and elsewhere around the world. I'm just going to start off with a totally global perspective of what's happening. Um, this on the on this graph, you see the historical emissions of CO2 to atmosphere. I've split it into two functions: the industrial age from about 1800 to 1850 to 1950, sorry, and what I've called the petroleum age from 1950 to the present, and then this future, which is what we're calling the energy transition. And if you look at the energy transition right now, it's been quite turbulent over the last few years. We've managed to perhaps plateau global emissions, but we still have a long way to go to reduce emissions to the level that the politicians are saying by 2050. And in fact, the green line says where we should be going to follow the 1.5 degree uh, goal, um, which is even more challenging. All of this is public domain data. If you zoom into the last couple of decades, uh, you see the only time we as a planet managed to reduce emissions, or we as a human civilization, I would say, was the global financial crisis of 2008 and the COVID pandemic of 2019 to 20. And sadly, and after each of those occasions, we picked up emissions again. Um, in a way, it showed that we could reduce emissions, but we needed a crisis to do so. And what we really need to get to the point is beyond crisis, we need to manage a, a, a rapid reduction in emissions. Now that is possible. So this is, uh, I've taken these two graphs from the IEA sustainable development scenario. Like any scenario, they're just, you know, well thought through forecasts for what might happen in the future. They're not predictions in any sense. But the really critical thing is that the dramatic reduction in emissions, we currently have about 38 gigatons of CO2 emitted to atmosphere. To reduce that to, uh, to take away 30 gigatons by 2050 or 37 gigatons by 2070, we need to do all of these things. Reduce demand, renewable power supply, electrification, uh, hydrogen economy, uh, improved technology, avoided demand, and bioenergy. And it's not an either or. All of these things have to be done. And then at the bottom, in the uh, purple, you see the CCUS component which is substantial, but still small compared to all of the others. Um, so if you just extract out CCS, we need about seven gigatons of CCS by 2050. And the same report then asks the question, what, what would the rollout of CCS look like? And you see there in the gray bars, you see 2050, it's about seven gigatons and 2070, it's about 10 gigatons of emissions reductions handled by CCS or CCUS. In the first decade, um, so the first gray bar is the current status. We currently globally have about 50 million tons of CO2 capture deployed globally. So it's not zero. We are already doing CCS, it's just not enough. We need to increase that to about one gigaton. So that's a 20 fold increase by 2030 and then seven gigatons by 2050. And this report helpfully breaks that down into which sectors will be decarbonizing. You've got coal, natural gas being the main energy part of the decarbonization, but then you've got a lot of industrial processes, the biomass and then direct air capture starting off very small. As you move beyond 2030, the components grow a lot, uh, coal and natural gas capture continue, uh, but you see that the negative emissions technology, biomass and direct air capture are envisaged to grow substantially. And beyond 2050, the negative emissions technology is actually dominant. So this is expressing how the energy transition will happen as a function of time. So that's the capture part, and it's just a well-stated challenge. And you can break that down into different regions if wherever you live, Europe, United Kingdom, United States, Canada, Middle East, Asia. Every nation actually has their plan um, for reducing emissions. So then I want to switch a little bit to the geoscience part of this, um, which is more of the home ground of the SEG and where I work. <laughs> so then I asked the question, OK, if that's what the capture technology demand is, can we deliver it from the storage point of view? 
Um, this is a summary of some work I did with Tip Meckel at University of Texas, Austin, published in 2019, where we looked at the well rate needed to deliver um, the needed CCS. Uh, it's a bit of a complicated graph, but on the left-hand axis, you have the number of CO2 injection wells, and on the right-hand axis, you have the cumulative CO2 injected. And the transfer between those is based on empirical data from known injection wells around the world with uncertainty bounds. So there's a P90, P, P, P10 range to this. And in this particular graph, I showed, we show the example of the Norway drill rate. So the red dots are historically the historical catalog of wells drilled in Norway since the beginning of the oil and gas industry and plateauing off uh, to the current situation. So you see a maturation of an industry. We then put the start of that industry in 2020 and said, what if all those wells were devoted to CO2 storage? And it turns out that you need um, globally by 2050, about 12,000 CO2 injection wells to deliver seven gigatons of storage. And this is very credible. It's much, much less than the number of oil and gas injectors we've drilled historically. So the future CCS industry is not as big as the historic oil and gas industry in terms of numbers of wells drilled. It's a very pragmatic and realistic objective. We then split it down into continental clusters. So Norway is about a fifth. The Norway well model is about a fifth of the global need. So we said, well, that's a typical continental CCS cluster. And if you break that out into timeline, in the next 10 years, we'll need 200 wells per cluster. And by 2040, we'll need 1,000 wells per cluster. And we can then ask, well, where are we now? Uh, these figures are not published uh, or not, not available publicly. So I've made my own approximate guess, which is why I've used roughly numbers. Currently in Europe, we have CO, about 10 dedicated CO2 injectors. And globally, we have about 50. If anyone wants to challenge me on those numbers, I'm happy to be challenged because they're just my initial estimates. But it's of that order. There are over, there are several thousand CO2 EOR, EOR injector wells. So they are not included because a lot of the North American CO2 EOR is using natural sources of CO2, but they are gradually ramping up to anthropogenic CO2. So you could add some more wells from the EOR projects. But it, it's basically saying we've started, but we have to accelerate. And then we can ask the question, well, okay, how are we gonna get this to happen? Because the perception is that a lot of CCS projects are too expensive. So we need to focus on reducing costs, managing risks, and probably the most important, building confidence. And I think one thing the SEG and subsurface community can do is, is help our society at large have a higher confidence in doing CCS. It's not a completely novel industry. It's, it's a, a mature technology. It just needs to be accelerated. I am very fortunate to live and work in Norway. The Norwegian government has put a lot of upfront funding into a project called Northern Lights or part of the Longship CCS project. And the Norwegian government is very clear they want to stimulate this industry and encourage others to follow. Um, and as a result of that, the Northern Lights project put in a bid to become part of an EU project of common interest. And this basically means that EU capture funding uh, can be uh, directed into this network. And the map on the left shows you all the parties that potentially could deliver CO2 to the Northern Lights project. And it's a lot. And then, then the project goes on to say, well, okay, who actually wants to deliver CO2 to our store? And incidentally, the store is uh, constructed and ready. The wells are drilled. The, uh, the land facility has been built and the project is ready to start injection in 2024. So the uh, partnership for the Northern Lights, that's Shell, Equinor and Total Energy uh, in a joint venture. They signed their first cross-border CCS agreement uh, last year, September, with the Yara Sluskil Ammonia and Fertilizer Plant in the Netherlands. That is CO2 capture from fertilizer production, which is one of the lower hanging fruits of carbon capture. Um, and they have already agreed to send some of their CO2 to Norway as, as a way of accelerating their decarbonization. So that was great news for the Northern Lights project. They had two Norwegian capture plants, and now they have a third international capture plant. And to show you the acceleration, 
hot off the press very, very recently. I think we're talking about two weeks ago, the JV of the Northern Lights announced a, announced a new agreement with Orsted in Denmark. And they agreed to store 430,000 tons of carbon emissions from two biomass power plants in Denmark. So you could say the ball in Northern Europe is rolling. And there are many other projects in the UK, Netherlands, uh, and the rest of Europe. So I, I'm, it's, this is not exclusive. It's just saying that things are really moving. And this is an encouragement to others to get moving too. So that is my summary of the challenge and a, a little bit of you know, a, a positive uh, trend for the accelerating growth of CCS projects. Um, I have quite a lot of contact with the North American projects in Canada and the United States, and I know there's a lot of activity in North America and is also encouraging activity in the Middle East and Asia. So, you know, the ball is rolling. We just need to make sure it rolls efficiently and fast. So in the second part of my talk, I want to switch to the geoscience subsurface part. And the first point I'd like to make very clear to maybe those of you that are not so familiar with CCS projects is that million ton per year CO2 storage projects is proven and demonstrated technology. It's been in operation for 26 years at Sleipner and decades at many other projects around the world. Um, we know the processes involved. And this sketch on the right shows you how CO2 will migrate in the subsurface from an injection well. There's a, a, a mobile component to the CO2, which is in the dark blue. There's a residually trapped component to the CO2 in the light blue. CO2 is trapped under structural traps and closures in green. And there's a process of dissolution in the water phase or the brine phase, which can be 10 or 20% of the total CO2 injected. And there is a, a CO2 mineralization, CO2 turning into rock. This is very small in saline aquifers, but it can be very large in, in other formations such as carbonates and basalts. So this te technology works at the million ton per year scale. So we could just replicate that, but the problem is that we have to scale up as well. And the other thing that we get gain from our existing projects is the ability to understand this process for different settings. So in the sketch at the bottom half of this page, you see some data from the Snövit, Snow White project in Northern Norway, where I show time-lapse seismic data from 2012 compared to a high resolution reservoir simulation model. And the important thing to note is that the seismic resolution is much less than, than is possible by high resolution modeling, but by iterating between time-lapse seismic and fluid forecasting, we can really refine our models and make the predictions really, really good. Because to convince our stakeholders and our publics that CO2 storage is safe, we have to demonstrate that safety in very quantitative ways. And, and the insights we have from the Norwegian projects, which are very long running, is that the seismic data confirms flow theory, but also helps us to refine and calibrate our models. So what about the challenges and the solutions? Um, well, to sort of capture this, and I, you know, I, I could say a lot today, but I'm just going to focus on three things. Uh, the principles of CO2 storage is that you have to demonstrate capacity, prove injectivity, and assure containment. And those are the three pillars of a CO2 storage project. I don't have time to review those. So what I will do is focus on what I call the three things that keep me awake at night. Maybe they keep you awake. So I've got three E's for you, which is how efficient is CO2 storage? What are the effects of pressure or fluid expansion in the store? And what about earthquakes? Will CO2 injection stimulate earthquakes? And these are, if you like, hot topics in CO2 storage technology. How, how do we understand these processes and how do we assure that things won't go wrong, like the pressure will increase above a threshold or that we would stimulate earthquakes? or that we wouldn't have enough capacity. Um, starting with the storage efficiency question, this is much debated. If you have a geological structure or target, you would like to say, well, how much CO2 can I get in there? And I don't have time to go through the theory in great detail in this short talk, but the simple answer is about 5% of the pore volume can be filled with CO2. And this number of four or 5%, is in a lot of the regional mapping studies for CO2 storage capacity. And the first reaction is, 
hey, can't we do better than that? That seems very inefficient. Well, the reason why it's so low is, is the physics. You're putting a uh, low viscosity fluid into a higher viscosity brine, and that low viscosity fluid is buoyant, similar to oil. And that gives you an unstable displacement or co called a, a very uh, high mobility ratio. Um, and it leads to that sort of fingering effect, which gives you a low vertical sweep efficiency. At the Sleipner project in the top right, you see an example of the 3D seismic imaging we have. So this is a time-lapse seismic image interpolated into where is the plume at 2008 from some very nice published work by some colleagues of mine. There are nine layers at Sleipner and we can map how the plume expands as a function of time. Oops, <laughs> go back again. Um, and so I've used some simple measures to estimate the storage efficiency at Sleipner. If I just create an ellipse around the plume and have a cylinder going vertically, I get this green curve, which is the EC curve, which is um, the storage efficiency for a simple measure of a box, and that's about 5%. But if I then say, well, wait a minute, the CO2 is not filling that very efficiently. So I, I look at the polygon shape of the plumes and I look at the aerial swept, then my storage efficiency increases to about 20%. And then you'll notice there's quite a lot of vertical segregation in the plume. So if I take into account the vertical occupancy in terms of how it fills the different layers, then I get the brown or the red curve, which is nearly 40% storage, uh, poor, poor space occupancy. So what's that telling you is it's telling you how CO2 storage filling the core volume scales as a function of volume heterogeneity. Um, if you look down at the pore scale, we don't think you can fill more than about 50 to 60% of the pore volume at the pore scale with CO2, just because of the physics of, of capillary pressure. Um, so this kind of analysis is very useful for planning future projects. And it tells you that you need to understand the geology, you need to understand the structural closures and potentially thin barriers within the unit to work out how much you'll actually store. So that's the first E that keeps me awake at night. <laughs> um, the second E, which is expansion or pressure, um, is a great fear that a lot of projects have, is that if I inject CO2, will I quickly exceed the fracture pressure and not be able to continue injecting? And there was a nice paper by Zhu and others, which I refer to many times, uh, which is sketched on the left-hand side. And their point was basically, yes, if you inject CO2 into a confined box, like perfectly sealing faults and cap rock, it is absolutely correct that you will not be able to inject more than 1% of the pore volume of CO2 because you will soon exceed the, the geomechanical limit. But if you have some semi-permeable membranes around the capture site or a completely open system where the native brine can be displaced, then the situation is quite different. And in fact, you get to situations like Sleipner where the water can be pushed out into the uh, aquifer around and there's no pressure, li pressure limit at Sleipner. So to handle this quite complex situation, what we did in the, the paper by uh, myself and Tip Meckel uh, on the global storage is we said, well, let's try and treat this problem analytically. And we derived pressure functions for um, uh, storage geometry A, which is an open aquifer system, and storage geometry B, which is a closed aquifer system. And you'll see that storage geometry B, the project has to stop prematurely because it reaches some pressure limit. Whereas storage geometry A can continue to the end of the project lifetime because it never reaches the, the project limit. And the rate of pressure rise is dependent on many factors, and we treat that analytically. And then to show you how complex reality is, here I'm just showing you an example. This is a new prospect area which is being developed offshore Norway called the Smehaia Prospect. Um, it's a series of fault blocks to the east of the Northern Lights project, which I just mentioned. And in this study by Long Wu and others, they mapped all the faults and all the recharge points and showed that it's highly complex how which faults communicate. So you can see in red, the communication through fault ramp relays. And on the blue, you can see possible communication with the mainland um, along a, a large basement fault. So the reality is complicated. 
And when the uh, the north, when this uh, Smeha group led by Equinor and, and partners drilled a CO2 exploration well called Gladsheim uh, in 2019, uh, they found they could quantify the actual pressure depletion um, in that well. So the setting here is that the troll gas field is depleting pressure, and we were worried that that depleting pressure could influence CO2 storage in the neighboring fault block. Fortunately, the amount of pressure depletion, shown here as 14 bars in the upper unit and 10 bars in the middle unit, is less than the, the worrying level, right? So basically the partial pressure communication to these faults was not fully open, just partial. That's good news for the Gladstone prospect, but it also tells us a little bit about how we need to take into account boundary conditions. This is an extremely complicated problem, and I don't think it's solved yet. How will fault connections affect future storage? Well, I did what a lot of people do. <laughs> I, I asked a couple of smart master's students to look at this problem, and they were uh, very clever. They coded up the analytical pressure functions I showed you, and they digitized the fault blocks in the set of simple scenarios. So on the right-hand side, you see two scenarios for faults in the Smehai region. And on the left-hand side, you see an analytical model for pressure rising as we inject CO2. It then reaches eventually some pressure limit with a red dotted line. So in this particular case, CO2 injection proceeds for 35 years before it's stopped, and then the pressure decays back again. But what about if we had more fault compartments? So scenario C3 there is the fault block has tighter fault blocks. And you see there that the pressure uh, rises to the limited pressure much quicker, and then the project has to stop prematurely. So you can see how the amount of CO2 you can detect and the pressure evolution will be determined very much by your geometry and aerial extent of fault box. They then run multiple scenarios uh, to come up with a, a cloud of forecasts. So each dot on this plot is one CO2 injection site in one fault block with different scenarios for geology, stratigraphy, and fault block size. And without going into too much detail, what we can do is analyze the cases that have very high pressure rise for relatively small pressure injection on the left. And these are the cases we would like to avoid. And then we have these cases in the purple and green dots in the middle of the graph, where we can get quite substantial CO2 injection volumes for a, a limiting and realistic pressure rise of about, uh, what was that, about 60 bars. Um, so that helps us to sort of focus. And in fact, the Gladsheim prospect where we drilled a well is one of the better cases. It, it, we think we can inject at least 100 million tons into that prospect without reaching a pressure barrier. So the summary of this work is that the pressure question, it is a, it is a big question, but it is something I think we can handle with smart analysis and good mapping of faults and, and compartment sizes. And the final question in my last few minutes of this talk is the question of earthquakes. Um, will CO2 injection cause earthquakes? And we don't know the answer to that question, but we can try and reduce the uncertainty by smart monitoring. And this is a plot of the seismicity in the offshore area around the Northern Lights project. So I don't know if you can see the Aurora word in there and the EOS uh, square, that's the injector well EOS and the Aurora is the site. So we're planning to inject CO2 in this region in here. There's actually very little seismicity in the region we're planning to inject, but around it, there's a lot of seismicity. And the project has two concerns, is would a large earthquake be falsely associated with the injection? And secondly, could the CO2 injection stimulate seismicity that would be of concern? And what we've been doing in the last five years, and that's re reported in this paper, led by Zoya Zarifi, is to assess the seismicity in the region to understand the background seismicity prior to starting injection. And this will allow us, we hope, to discriminate very clearly between natural seismicity and possible injected seismicity. The beach balls are you know, fault plane solutions, which is the, the, uh, the stress state of individual large earthquakes. And they tell us a lot about the stress field and one of the early observations we find is that we go from a critically, a more, a higher stress ratio situation on the Norwegian mainland. And when we go offshore, 
we have a lower stress ratio and less critically stressed situation in the sedimentary system. And ideally, we want to inject into rock formations that are relatively soft and do not respond uh, to, to fracturing when, when the pressure is increased a small amount. And we're trying to assess that continually. So this is ongoing work. So to summarize, um, you know, I've, I've taken you through the really big picture of CCS globally. And then I've tried to help you and me focus on what do we need to do for CO2 storage projects and picked out a few kind of uh, top topics, which was pressure, efficiency, and earthquakes. And hopefully that'll give you some inspirational ideas for the future. And later in this, uh, in this seminar, you're gonna hear more about the work on earthquake detection in Western Norway. So you'll hear more about that soon. Um, I haven't, what I haven't told you very much about is geophysical monitoring. So I'll just end up with that. But um, I, I think, and I'm very committed to this concept is that really good and successful CO2 stores have really good monitoring. I'm, I'm not talking about over the top blanket monitoring. I'm talking about smart, intelligent monitoring to assure everybody that the site is proceeding well. And in the sketch here, you see some, some sort of concepts that we're working on uh, is for the offshore setting in Norway. Uh, obviously we would use standard geophysical surveys, but we're looking more and more at how could we use seabed sensors or fiber optic sensing, both downhole and at surface to better understand and monitor a CO2 storage project. And, and the other thing is that you need to monitor several things for a CO2 storage project. You're not only monitoring the plume, you need to monitor the fluid pressure and the expansion of the fluid pressure out into the formation. And you also need to look at rock deformation. As you increase the fluid pressure, you will change the effect of stress. Therefore, you need to understand micro seismicity and potential low seismicity rock deformation. And the point about monitoring is that it should build confidence in projects. It's not, it's not like you're finding information you don't want to know. It's, it's giving you information you do want to know. It helps quantify poorly constrained parameters, like what is the in-situ rock stress. And as we've learned from many projects, you cannot predict everything. You will get geological surprises as a CO2 project proceeds. So we want to detect those geological surprises, anticipate them, and plan for them. Um, <clears throat> And, and then specifically and legally, what you have to do in CO2 storage projects is demonstrate to the authorities two things, conformance, which means that the CO2 is storage is proceeding according to plan and containment, which means that the CO2 is not leaking. And you need to do those things for legal permits, but it also helps you to sleep at night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Uh, very interesting talk and very, very, very uh, interesting uh, keynote uh, presentation and uh, right to the point. But uh, if there are any questions uh, from the audience, please put them in the QA box and we uh, we put them on the air and we let the person also uh, discuss. The program today will also include information as what um, as uh, what Philip said with regards to micro seismic monitoring or earthquake monitoring and also activities on resolve monitoring. And it will be interesting to, to see in those presentations is how they reflect onto, the, onto this keynote speech. One of the questions uh, I have is what you mentioned in the beginning on the accuracy of the modeling, right? So then we, we need to understand quite accurately the geology part of it, the resolve model part of it. And uh, so what, what, what is the accuracy levels? Do you, do we expect for these projects compared to oil and gas projects, for example? Uh, how much do we need to know more? Yeah, you mean what? What do we need to detect, or how how accurate can we be? How can how accurate can we do we need to understand subsurface for this type of yeah. Uh, yeah. so pre pre uh, starting injection, for example, what you yes. mentioned position yeah. of bolts and uh, pressure communications stuff like that. It's it, it's a really good question, I mean, So I mean, I think we shouldn't oversell the ability of geophysical methods to detect, there's always a detection limit. So, you know, we, we have to sort of be open and clear that say, you know, I can only detect 60 or 80% of the CO2 using time-lapse seismic monitoring. There's always a part that you don't detect. But on the other question of like, how much geological information do you need? When you think about CO2 storage, as the plume, as the CO2 migrates into the formation, it's very strongly controlled by small-scale geological heterogeneities 
which you cannot predict up front. But it does mean that you need as good as possible 3D seismic, I would say, when you start a CCS project, because you really need to map faults. They, they are one of the key questions. Am I injecting near a fault? How do the faults connect? And similarly with stratigraphic barriers. So I think one of the things we've learned from our projects in the last couple of decades is that having good baseline data is really important. So to some extent, you need a really good initial 3D seismic survey, and then you need to be smart and frugal with how much time-lapse data you collect and doing that in a cost-effective way. Um, whereas saving money up front on a CCS project is probably a bad idea. <laughs> You'll probably be hit with a surprise that will cost you later. Yeah, that's a very, very good point. Um... And uh, it's always better to be upfront and uh, assess the risks before we continue with such an. Especially as you mentioned, we are uh, we, need, we, have, we have certain obligations to the government and to authorities. And that. But it, but it is hard for CCS projects to to persuade their funders to do so much work upfront. So it's a real challenge, you know. Very good. Um, we have several questions in uh, coming up in the chat. But what I suggest, uh, Philip, is that that's all right with you. We we can take them up in the panel discussion. No problem. Uh, the... I'll, I'll check the timing of the panel discussion. Uh, yeah, yeah, in the program. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the good, great presentation. And uh, we continue with our, uh, thank you. And we continue with our uh, program. Uh, for our next presentation, we have uh, Ziki uh, Shu. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. Uh, he comes to us from the Research Institute of Innovative Technology uh, for the Earth, uh, or better known as IRTE from Japan. And he's going to talk to us today about uh, the Japanese carbon neutrality policy and the CCS long-term roadmap. So with that, I'll hand you over to Ziki. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ziki Shu. I'm a chief of research at Lloyd. Uh, it's my great pleasure to give us a brief introduction on Japanese carbon neutrality policy and update the CCS long-term roadmap. Uh, Japan is a small country, but it's a bigger uh, CO2 uh, emitter. In 2020, 2021, the CO2 emission is still up to more than 1 billion ton. The so most CO2 comes from the uh, fuel or industry because they're using coal or the gas. Uh, a big portion of the CO2 emission is come from the electricity and the heat because they're using the uh, fossil Energies. So government uh, is working on the CO2 reduction by launching the target reduction target uh, by 46 percent in 20, 2030, uh, compared to 2030, uh, 2013, which is the highest one. Is the peak here is 1.32 billion ton, and then, then to achieve the net zero in 2050. So a lot of approaches is ongoing, uh, offshore wind power, solar, heat energy, hydrogen, the fuel, and ammonia. So CCS is including hydrogen, the ammonia. Um, other options like uh, next generation heat energy and the nuclear powers. Uh, government also stated the green growth strategy uh, through the, this program uh, because they want to uh, uh, want to install another uh, approach is, is uh, the policy roadmap, including plans for the national ETA system to expand the, the current joint credit mechanism is JCM. Uh, the JCM credit can, can be uh, implemented in the large scale uh, project. Large scale project includes CO2 capture and the storage. So it is, um, it's a very big uh, news for the Japanese community, uh, CCS committee, because the government now do has the uh, current uh, carbon taxes. Price is just uh, US dollar, uh, around the $2 per ton. It's quite small. So the government tried to expand this, the, uh, the JCM uh, system also uh, into it. In, uh, introduced the new national ETS. So what we're discussing now is uh, 
how to achieve the net zero uh, in Japan, because as you uh, already understand, we are using uh, coal, uh, gas, and oil. So I, I always introduce, uh, use this slide to the uh, committee members, uh, because most of people understand it. Uh, they want to use they want to use hydrogen, but as this slide indicates, uh, if you want to uh, produce hydrogen, it seems they always need to take care of the CO uh, two storage. So CCS and the hydrogen are always uh, like the good brothers. So how to do the uh, uh, how to achieve the the, the net zero uh, in twenty fifty in Japan? Uh, the big uh, task for us is to do the CO2 storage. So we're working on uh, storage safety issues, how to reduce the cost, how to get the public uh, engagement. The government uh, set up a uh, lower map, uh, Japan's policy for the carbon because without CCS, it's not possible to achieve net zero. So the government from this fiscal year, we start with uh, uh, CCS uh, uh, feasibility study starting from 2023, then allows the, uh, the operator to make the surgeon by 2026, and then uh, start CO2 injection in 2030. So here shows the, the full menu here, uh, the business activities, registration is on the way, sales cost reduction is a, is a big task for us because I'm working on the uh, R&D program. Uh, the, the, the target for uh, the CO2 cost reduction in terms of the monitoring part, we need to achieve at least the 20%. So the government committed to support the, the, uh, the feasibility study in, and uh, uh, even the operation cost uh, up to 100%. So the, the fully uh, uh, supported by government. Uh, not only the inside Japan, but also overseas uh, CCS project. That means the government is working uh, hard on the uh, CCS uh, storage projects now. So in Japan, when we talk about uh, CO2 storage, people always ask questions to us. Do we have the storage potential? Do we have the site for CO2 storage? The government uh, this year announced the storage capacity about uh, in Japan, uh, from the 11 site, the potential is up to uh, 16 uh, billion ton, and the plans uh, still plan to do more uh, for seismic uh, uh, geological surveys to improve, uh, to find more sites uh, around the Japan island. Uh, Lloyd also working on the uh, cost estimation, estimation uh, just to show example here for an offshore storage site. Estimated the storage cost is around uh, seven uh, seven thousand yen. It's, uh, it's around uh, uh, sixty five US dollars per ton CO two. Uh, for an issue for us is uh, the where, how much CO two we can inject it through a one way. Uh, we we checked this right here. It's just uh, two hundred kiloton per year. Uh, it's uh, uh, seven seven thousand yen. But if we can increase the rate up to uh, 500 kiloton per year per year, uh, the cost will reduce to uh, 5,400 yen. So the issue is how to improve the injection rate, how to secure uh, the storage capacity, and also the injecting is a big issue for the uh, storage part. So I think the uh, to reduce the cost, the big issue for the Japanese uh, uh, society, uh, Japanese government is how to uh, find a good match because the most of the CO2 source is around the coast area uh, or the inside is in the area. It's difficult to derate the uh, CO2 uh, source, emission source location uh, to the uh, storage parts. And uh, another part is how to tell the local people or the or the people uh, the uh, gets the uh, public uh, engagement. I use this this slide very uh, very often to tell you that uh, we do have the potential risks 
in the CO2 storage project. We also need to take care of the cost and, and for the uh, of the public outreach, we need to work on uh, scientific scientific knowledge and the evidence uh, based risk communication. We just give the talk. We need to show the results, uh, which we we collected data from the real site and then tell the local people. Uh, we can do uh, we can do this. Uh, we can secure the uh, uh, we can manage the risks. So most cases in Japan, we're, fa we're facing the challenges, the injectivity and the contaminant and also the induced seismicity. Uh, we don't have the good sound like in, like Slapner, they have the sick and also high permit sound layers. In Japan, I can say the sound layer unit, the, sound, the storage unit is small, the permit is not so high. So we are working on uh, another uh, approach how to tackle the, the complex geology, like Philip mentioned, the hydrolite of the reservoir. Uh, our idea is, can we utilize the pore space by uh, ending CO2 in different manner? In this case, I show you the micro bubble. It means the CO2 in a small bubble. I can reduce the, uh, the capillary pressure, uh, allow the CO2 to penetrate into the small pore space, then increase, enhance the source storage efficiency. We had a, a one, we have one uh, pilot project in Japan. Uh, we run the two CO2 injection uh, test, one uh, with microbubble CO2 injection, one is uh, conventional CO2 injection. For the microbubble injection, we injected uh, uh, the mixture of CO2 and brine at 90% of CO2 plus 10% uh, of brine, allow you to uh, secure this uh, bubble always can generate in the subsurface. So just simply install the uh, downhole tool to generate a micro bubble and around the target formation. It shows some uh, shows one photo here. You can change the bubble is the, in very small uh, size. Typically, uh, the bubble size would be ten micro a meter. It's almost the range of the pore space in the sub in the reservoir. You can connect the, the downhole tools and the, as you like, because you need to fit the uh, uh, injection intervals. We can party the two tests. One is micro bubble seat injection because uh, we only have chance, had one chance to inject uh, the CO2 uh, as uh, oil feed, which is uh, permit is quite low. So just 10 days, we inject a 20 ton CO2 in micro bubble scale. And then uh, after a couple of days, we run the half pop taste and produced how much uh, produced uh, brine and CO2 from the target reservoir. Then we es estimated how much CO2 is actually stored in the subs and uh, in the reservoir. For the microbubble CO2 injection is 80%. Uh, for, for the conventional CO2 injection, means without the downhole to uh, the storage efficiency. Uh, so percentage is six, uh, 63. You can find the big difference between the two injection tastes. Uh, we, we run the twist, two tastes in same conditions and the same target formation, uh, but it finds the difference up to 17%. Uh, another bigger point is uh, by injecting uh, micro bubble will increase the, the injection index. For the micro bubble, it's almost 0.4 ton per day per megapascal. For the un, uh, for the conventional, it's just 0.1, so almost four times. So this te technology allows us to index CO2 or to store CO2 in complex geology, also the high uh, heterogeneity and the low permeability reservoir. So another technology we're working on is the fiber uh, optic sensing. We are working together with the United States uh, the the literature energy the company that produced the CO two from the uh, from the the uh, ethanol plant so they they plant they are injecting uh, one hundred eighty kiloton CO two per year through this wheel so we installed all fiber case fiber cables uh, behind the casing of this injection wheel and is a monitoring wheel then. Uh, 
also we also uh, set up a server uh, SOV which is a uh, continuous uh, generator uh, to generate the vibrations uh, from the ground surface to run the uh, DAS VSP uh, to monitor the CO2, how the CO2 accumulated in the reservoir. This approach has been uh, approved by uh, US EPA Class 6 uh, regulation. Uh, the CO2 indication started uh, last year, almost one year. Uh, so it's a good chance for us to demonstrate our uh, DTS technology to run the, to monitor the, the temperature uh, along the pipeline and the well and the acoustic survey uh, that to check to monitor the CO2 plume uh, in at this injection wave. And so also uh, DS is uh, string sensing to look at the, the cap rock system or the uh, the pipeline system to integrate this. So here she is the menus here, uh, and the summary of the underground ignition control. So this is uh, the document uh, submitted to the uh, US EPA, the class six permit. So here, here I just uh, highlighted several circuits showing the silt flow line. You, they use the DTS and the DAS and the DSs. And uh, for the internal, external mechanical integrity is mostly to the look at the, the like the wear integrity, also the capital integrity, will run DTS and DAS fiber cables. And uh, direct reservoir monitoring, uh, we're running the DTS and the DAS, also DSS. For the ground surface uh, insights, it's ongoing. Uh, we, we do our uh, DSS monitoring and a uh, fully coupled analysis with the, the, uh, with the INSAR, uh, because we also look at the ground water waves. So other collaborations, uh, because we, we need to uh, tell people how to uh, deal with the faults in Japan. So we are working with uh, Australia, uh, two uh, researching institutes. One is uh, CSIO. Uh, CSIO already developed a site in South Perth. They have done a lot of, lot of jobs here. And uh, take, uh, looking at the, the, this big fault they call F10, uh, seems uh, the F10 has a, a major structure features here. The so offset is 1,000 meters, and the fault zone is 250 meters wide. They already done a lot of works, even uh, included the uh, fiber cable DTAs. So we were uh, at another pro component, uh, strain sensing, to uh, improve the understanding of the of the fault system, or to want to characterize how the fault system, the fault zone is, is leaking or is seeding. Uh, we can, we can uh, find the answer through our uh, string sensing. Uh, this year we will drill another way, uh, another way here, close to the fault zone, and then uh, look at the, the fault zone uh, hydrodynamic uh, properties through the string sensing. So another site is at Otway. We are working with CLC. Uh, look at the shallow part of the fault. Uh, try to uh, understand the fault leaking, and also how fiber optic sensing can uh, work with to detect the, the uh, migration through the fault uh, by applying the uh, strain sensing and the temperature sensing. So. This spring, we just uh, completed two uh, wires and uh, installed our fiber cables. Next month, we'll, we will travel to the site and then run the water injection test to check the, the communication among the, all the wires. And then we can figure out how uh, string things is sensitive to the, to the uh, small fluid migration through this fault zone. Uh, thank you very much. That's my talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting talk and also from a Japanese vision. I was just wondering how this you, we have some minutes to the break and then we actually take a break after this talk until 13.25. But maybe because, um, maybe before we go to the break, um, how how is the communication with other countries in the region? For example, uh, of course, CO2, uh, storage for CO2 is only not coming only from the plants as we have here, but also from activities, oil and gas activities, but also a lot of it is from the coal activities, right? 
and maybe it's not as much in, in Norway, but other parts of the world, it's uh, there's a lot of cold activity that generates a lot of um, uh, greenhouse house gases. So how is it with with this type of communication with other countries in the region uh, to on this on this path for CCS? You, you described there was a communication with Australia, but uh, do you have other examples as well? Uh, I think. Uh, uh... Governments, Japan, Japanese government understand the, it's very tough for the uh, uh, for the operators to do big projects in Japan, and uh, because the emission, so say emission one one billion ton is is quite huge number, so that's why the government try to support both uh, domestic and the international uh, projects, uh, maybe. In the near future, because Japan will import hydrogen from hydrogen or ammonia from Austria or maybe Southeast Asian countries. Mm -hmm. So I think they they need to think about do CO two storage at the, uh, in Austria or in uh, Southeast Asia because they're always couple to take it. So build some sort of hub and then uh, let others to to engage and also build small hubs their own perhaps. Yeah. Yes, I think. So. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you for a great presentation. Um, I'll introduce the next speaker, uh, if I may. Andres uh, Zabados uh, from Wintershall DEA and Spotlight Earth. Uh, he'll be talking to us uh, this afternoon uh, about the Green Sands focused seismic monitoring for offshore CO2 pilot injection. If you please, Andres. All right, so it's um, it's a great pleasure to me to, to present and discuss um, some preliminary results from our um, Green Sand Phase 2 focused seismic monitoring for the offshore CO2 pilot injection. This is basically a presentation um, jointly prepared by, by me, by Habib, and also by CC from INEOS um, Energy Denmark. And Winter Saldia and INEOS Energy Denmark being operator for the Nini and Siri uh, fairway um, basically, we, we are uh, the, the core part of, of our research. So basically, let's look into the project Green Sand at first, before we come to the concrete um, operations uh, we did in the winter. So actually, Green Sand is standing for the conversion of a depleted oil um, production fairway, which is called the Siri fairway, having... Um, infrastructure out there. And we are maturing since 2021, the so-called full-scale uh, storage project. And we successfully awarded a license um, together with, with uh, Nazi Fonden, Ineos and Winter Saldea in early 2023, covering the entire Siri Canyon. In 2023, in the winter, we did successfully the pilot injection. I'll come back to that um, in, in a minute. And as a joint venture, we have 20 years of experience in, in uh, developing and producing the hydrocarbons, the oil basically from, from the reservoirs. And now since 2021, early 2022, we are running the um, Green Sand Phase Two Research Consortium, having altogether 23 participants from industry and research. And the overall project is led by Ineos Energy and, and Winter Saldea. You might have heard about the celebration we took in March. The first liquid CO2 is sailed to Denmark. Um, that was basically the start of our pilot injection. And we are aiming at ramping up um, and maturing the, the capacity, the storage capacity by 2025 or 2026 to 1.5 million tons per year. And we have the vision to scale it up to eight, five to eight million tons per year um, until 2030. Now we are basically active in around the Nini A wellhead platform, which you see at the lower right hand figure. Let me flip to the next one to so have a quick look at, at the reservoir. You see here, an image uh, um, obtained from uh, the legacy 3D seismic and you see the AVO effect that the oil created, um, which is basically here the, the reddish uh, colors pinching out towards the salt dome. And then in bluish colors, you see basically the aquifer below the former 
oil water contact. The Nini West segment is depleted since 2017, and it was developed by one producer and one water injector, the NA5, which is currently still injecting water from the Nini A wellhead platform. The reservoir itself is um, very favorable in regard of, of, of um, oil production, of course, but also we think very favorable in regard of storing CO2. 30-35% porosities, high permeabilities, and very homogeneous reservoir with excellent connectivity and strong aquifer support. Um, and then we have more than 300 meters up to 700 meters of marine shales uh, forming the primary cap rock, this, the lark formation. We have now in the injection pilot operation injected into the NA5 well, which you can also see. Let me put the pointer, which you see here. So we inject it into the water leg. And this is a nice image I like because you see here on the left hand side, uh, the drawing, the vision we had two years ago to go for a pilot injection. And on the right hand side, you see the concrete operations in the winter, shipping the CO2 in um, a custom made setup of ISO containers on a coastal carrier from the Ineos oxide plant in Antwerp to the Nini A site into a, a rig up, a, a, jack, a jack up that was rigged uh, to, the, um, to the wellhead platform and connected the flow line, the heater, the pumps um, into the wellhead. And we finally um, managed to inject CO2. So before we, come to the point of preliminary insights to our seismic. Let me first set the scene with some principal remarks in regard of conventional 4D seismic for CO2 plume monitoring. We, I think all agree that 4D seismic um, brings along a lot of environmental impact and also a big downside is that you have, you have to need years between the measurement. It takes years for processing, for, for, for tendering, contracting, operating, or permitting, operating, and processing, and interpreting the data. So a more frequent measurement even does not make sense, not talking about the cost at all for the moment. And also, we all know simulation models have high intrinsic geological uncertainty. So the question is, um, and this is also a big difference to, to oil and gas simulation models, where if you encounter a surprise, then you might end up with less production or even more production. But you do not really want to end up in a surprise with regard to CO2 plume monitoring. So what we need is a more frequent subsurface monitoring in order to reduce environmental impact and cost. So we can, and we did also some modeling uh, beforehand, utilize on the CO2 generation uh, generating a fast and strong seismic response in our uh, concrete reservoir setting. So what do we expect and why did we choose to test the focused seismic concept of, of spotlight in our research? Um, we, we think that simu the simulation models should basically predict where and when to focus the CO2 according to the forecast in key areas. So the frequency and the exact location of our monitoring of the plume should be defined by, by, by the simulation model, focusing on the areas of importance. And of course, we always need a 3D a seismic in place for full wave feed analysis in order to develop the best areas for, for this 1D or this single source, single receiver um, concept. So focus seismic is, is very efficient as it does measure the absence or the presence of CO2, which you, of course, need to predict beforehand. So with more frequent and focused measurements, we think we can reduce uncertainties and increase the accuracy of a probabilistic model over time. Let's look exactly again to uh, what, what we have been doing. So basically, what we did in our concept planning and design planning is basically to define spots where we actually wanted and, and are sure that we would need to see 
CO2 in the seismic response. That's what we call detection spots surrounded by model validation spots where according to the plume modeling, plume forecast, we do not see the, the do not want to see the CO2 in the trace. And the spot diameter is approximately 40 meters based on, on, on physical um, uh, principles. And in, indeed, we plan for 14 shipment cycles ending in 12,000 tons of CO2, but we were only able to realize seven due to very bad weather in January and early February. So we, in, in, uh, in consequence, did only inject approximately half of the CO2, liquid CO2, as planned. So we have less detection spots. So this, this model plume here, in fact, is after the full 14 cycles. And now our plume is roughly half of the size. And we realized approximately 2,000 tons of CO2 injected in monitor one and approximately 4,000 after monitor two and all, of course, um, associated with a baseline acquisition at the beginning before we injected CO2. Now, here you see the planning, the seismic acquisition plan, and we selected a low energy air gun, just 600 centi inch and, and the TGS mass three node. Um, and we deployed um, 16 receiver locations and we acquired at seven source locations, approximately 80 shots per source location as a static marine acquisition. Three campaigns again, baseline monitor one and two. And one of the aims were to learn to acquire seismic from a standard supply vessel because this supply vessel, SVAC Innovator, basically is under contract of INEOS operating the facilities. And we were able to combine this, um, these campaigns with routine cargo runs um, and that is one of the visions that we learn to go along with a very agile um, seismic acquisition um, in parallel to, to, to basically vessel movements. And still, of course, the data is not yet analyzed in full and is ongoing, but we not only have acquired the 80 shots per seven source locations. We also did a towed operation. So we acquired three, what we call 2D shot lines, um, roughly every 50 meters, always along the same azimuth. So um, we can also compare baseline monitor one and monitor two, um, more or less um, along the same um, travel uh, trajectory of the vessel. And we also did uh, numerous tests with uh, dropping nodes and co-located nodes. And, and all of the load, node locations were basically positioned very accurately by an ROV. Um, so we can conclude the positioning accuracy and signal to noise ratio is stunning, is, is excellent. And even more, if you um, combine the, um, the source and receiver locations, um, with regard to the common refraction point in the reservoir, you end up with many more um, seismic traces running exactly through the reservoir. So that is what we call spots of opportunity. These are source receiver combinations. And this is basically also an idea that we uh, want to follow up whether in the long run, we would be even able to obtain spatial information from this single source, single receiver concept. Now let's look what we have achieved. Um, we, 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 we can demonstrate that we significantly reduced the emissions and operational time compared to a full 4D or 3D seismic, streamer-based based, uh, seismic. Um, if you take the duration, it's 80% less. If you take the vessel emissions, it's 90% it's less. And if you look at the number of shots um, the 3,780 is even the planned number of shots. I think in the, in, the, in the end, we acquired a bit less. So it is also about 85, uh, 95, 98% of reduction of effort. And preliminary, I'm happy to conclude that um, we can 
see, and we will talk about that in much more detail, um, a CO2 effect in monitor two and monitor one, and that we confirmed and measured basically our model detection threshold of 2,500 tons of CO2. And with this, I would like to hand over to Habib. Uh, so, yes, many thanks, Andreas, for this uh, uh, presentation. And I'm uh, just here for the five last minutes to present you the actual operation and results. So, like Andreas said, one of the key points of, of what we were doing on this project was to the agility and the flexibility of the system that allow us not to do a single measurement in the winter, but three different measurements in the winter, January, February, and March. And as you can see here, this picture had been taken during our operation. And even though monitor three, March, 2023, seems to be a bit bumpy, yeah. we were able every time to grasp two very small and tiny weather window, 12 hour weather window in between two storms in the North Sea in the winter, enabling uh, uh, Wintershall and Ineos to have uh, information of reservoir changes during winter. Now, if you can go to the next slide, Andreas, I have a question for uh, the audience. Can you guess what this is? Is it a nice tabular geology, a synthetic traces, single trace repeated over time on baseline monitor one and monitor two, or AE generated image? Obviously, if you go on the next slide, Andreas, I think everyone uh, know that it is in fact baseline, monitor one and monitor two for a single source location and a single receiver locations. So how can we be with just a 600 cubic inch shooting in winter so repeatable? Well, the next slide will provide you with some element of response. First, you all know that source and receiver mispositioning is the number one mis um, 4D noise factor in offshore seismic. Because we were in calm sea and because we were using absolutely, you can click Andreas, absolutely static receivers, uh, we know that on the receiver side, we are good. What about the source side? Well, as you can see, with all the shots on baseline and monitor one and monitor two, we were able to uh, have and hold a position of a two meter radius and most of the shot in a one meter radius. That means we can do a temporal stack with our static position in order to turn the 81st trace, 50 last trace, and 60 middle trace into a single measurements with a high signal to noise ratio. If you go on the next slide, there is another explanation, which is indeed the optimum finding. So for each spot, you are data mining the existing exploration seismic in order, as you can see on the streamer data, which is a left panel, the optimal signal to noise ratio in terms of trace, offset, and azimuth, where you know the seismic signal will be great. We repeated 80 shots on this green trace, which is the middle panel. And if you, leave, if you look at the right panel, you see that a zero offset shot repeated 30 times show a much lower signal to noise ratio. So it's a combination of CAMC, permanent and perfect source and receiver position, and optimum selection that provided us with this great data. To finish with this last slide, next slide. You can see that if you zoom in after processing on the reservoir area, petrolastic model is telling us that on the top of the reservoir, a CO2 arrival will see a negative uh, uh, signal coming to a positive peak. So let's look where the, reserve, the top reservoir is. And you can click, Andreas. Then obviously you see that it is right where you see a polarity flip. So this is how we can say, if you click, two times that we detected CO2 for this antenna. Let's look for another spot. If you look to this spot and if you look again to the reservoir level and you can click, you clearly see that there is no polarity flip indicating the absence of presence of CO2. Indeed, with a much bigger CO2 effect, you would have expected a bigger uh, 4D effect and a time shift on top of that. Now you can go to the last slide. Yes, maybe I conclude first uh, with the uh, first two uh, bullets here. So Project Vincent and uh, associated research partners, first injection was an operational success paving the way for the Denmark uh, CCS uh, story. And um, the innovative focus seismic monitoring solution had been proven successfully, Habib. And I could, I could add that uh, we enable and validate uh, 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 with 
frequent seismic monitoring, the production hypothesis. And the best analogy we can use to explain how we use spots is several smoke detectors in a flat or a building to tell you if there is a fire, not where the fire is. So in fact, it's giving you early warnings that something is going wrong so that you could trigger expensive verification method like full 4D or other technology that will bring you the confidence to know how big is the fire and where the fire is located. With that, I want to conclude by highlighting the fact, and it has been said in the previous presentation, that there are strong synergies with passive application like micro seismic and uh, uh, focused seismic monitoring in the sense that the receiver are staying for 100 days in the seafloor and can be used for that. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. And this is basically the last slide to acknowledge our research consortium and you see the logos of each of the 23 collaboration partners. Thank you very much. And then I can introduce the first. Um, the next speaker is Bill Abreu uh, and that's the CO2C modeling. Okay, so thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to be here for this particular workshop. I think it's very interesting. And uh, what I'd like to do would be to see if I could uh, walk you a little bit through the um, project that we have at the SDG Advanced Model Corporation. Uh, and uh, I'm speaking on behalf of Seem, along with uh, Mike Failer and Joe Stephanie today. And I know Shelly Oakley is also on board. So uh, what I want to do is I want to talk you through uh, why it is that we are looking at simulation benchmarks. Uh, why go to the trouble of uh, generating, you know, large scale numerical testing grounds? Uh, first of all, it provides the ground truth um, and ground truth is real important. Uh, and because we make everything up ourselves, uh, we know what the ground truth is. We need to also find a way to link the various simulators that are associated with the sort of work that we're talking about. Um, identifying the challenges and parameter space like patchy versus dispersed saturation, how best to handle that. Uh, you can do sensitivity tests, perturb the models, find out you know, how, it, how it plays. Uh, we're not constrained to any particular specific geology or project, and we can acquire whatever data, whenever we want it, whatever sampling. So, so it's a good place to uh, to build experience. Uh, well, the way that we operate SEAM, uh, which we've done for about 15 years now, is that the participants of SEAM design the challenges and manage the quality control. So it's not really a consortium, it's a cooperative uh, with a project manager. Uh, and uh, Mike Failer is one of the great project managers at SEAM, and they facilitate various teams uh, and do the third-party contracts. SEAM administration handles the finance, legal, public interface, and we've worked with about 23 or 24 companies now over the course of that 15-year period. What we're working uh, now at is the CO2 sequestration numerical benchmarks uh, for CO2 sequestration, and our uh, participants are Saudi Chevron, Conoco Oxy, SLB, Shell, Sinopec, Total, and Woodside. We are going to be working on an expansion of a project that we did with the National Energy Technology Laboratory a little while ago, uh, which was um, life of field, uh, complex 4D um, uh, simulations. And what we have is an opportunity then to do things like uh, have open faults and closed faults. We know the water saturations, the gas saturations, pore pressure, geomechanical strain, all the geophysical elements. Um, it's interesting if you can see my um, my cursor. This is actually a depletion drive portion of the reservoir. You can see the water coming up through the complex geology. Uh, this is uh, actually the gas the gas coming out of solution uh, and generating gas cap uh, and the mechanical strain you can see is uh, complicated. But the most interesting thing is that if you look at the uh, just the geophysical expression of the shear wave, uh, it's not random and there are multiple complex things going on. So the trick is to try to take that simulated data and invert it to see if you can get close to this and that's a real, real big challenge. So we're going to be working with that um, for the CO2 project. Our three-year plan is to have monitoring simulations 
uh, and then we'll process that data nominally uh, so it's ready for interpretation that, that uh, our participants can use. And then we'll do a value of information for different monitoring techniques, um, individually standalone techniques or combined techniques. And the plan is also to partner uh, with public organizations about challenges and findings um, because we don't want to be doing this alone. Uh, we want to impact the industry uh, in a way that's positive and effective for us. There are a number of ways we can go through this. Uh, and what we did was we sat down and asked the question, do you want a sandstone, saline aquifer, carbonate aquifer, depleted gas reservoirs, oil reservoirs, onshore, offshore? We can't do them all at once. Uh, so we are in the midst of a work on a pilot demonstration, which is an onshore saline sandstone, shallow to moderate depth. we are shrunk it down as small as we can, uh, very dense sampling. Lots of stratigraphic complexity, 80% uh, solution to the rock physics variables because there's some really interesting ones out there. Uh, and we'll be doing both successful um, capture and leaking CO2 injection simulations uh, and using most geophysical techniques that are available uh, and simulating. The reservoir, if you look at this density section, the main reservoir is here, it's a turbidite section, uh, and you can see the complex stack turbidites. Um, and we'll have a fault that seals over here. There's also a middle reservoir, in case things do come up, uh, we'll see it captured in the middle reservoir. And if it turns out that it continues to leak into an upper reservoir, we could see that as well. So that's interesting. Uh, and the question is, how are we defining the parameters? Um, because there's a lot to put in there. Uh, the answer is on the basis of geological basis functions using primitives in, that are independent, uh, and you can combine them to make geological models of interest. The parameters here are V shale, which is you know one minus V sand and porosity. So a vertical stack average of the um, porosity looks like this. V sand uh, permeability is that. Uh, just gives you a feel for uh, what the model looks like. The practice, uh, which is uh, difficult to do, uh, starts with the geology and the structure and lithology from which we then have the primitives, the V shale porosity. Then the saline fluid saturation pressure, stress, resistivities. Then on the static model, uh, working through the elastic properties. Uh, and we have that modeling from raw property and then the geophysics. For the dynamic model, of course, we'll uh, swap out and have CO2 injection. Uh, and then we'll be able to measure the delta properties the delta elastic parameters, the delta geophysics, right? And see the monitoring practice and the geomechanics as well. So you can't just go into models and change numbers, like right? density and et cetera. You gotta go all the way back to the geology to make that happen. So, um, so here's an example of uh, how we have to go about what we're trying to accomplish for defining things in the reservoir, which can change from place to place either dispersed where we've got these little CO2 bubbles sitting inside the fluids and pores and there's the matrix or patchy where you've got uh, a lot of CO2 in the pores and then, but another area not too far away from it, you didn't get any CO2. In it. So here is what happens in the fluids, um, the compressibility of the fluid. So here we are with some water saturation, which is one. So you have zero CO2. And we think that we'll be uh, working with a, um, uh, a fluid compressibility curve that looks something more like this. So you'll see most of the activity of uh, monitoring uh, brighten up here in the first 10% mm, and 20% after which it becomes pretty linear. Uh, and that's the way that we'll be instituting these uh, geostatistically uh, saturated patchy systems. The other thing, of course, uh, and this are just some examples of the parameters that we kind of have to deal with is, is Q uh, and attenuation. Uh, we think the, the extrinsic seismic wave attenuation is scattering will be good. There's a lot of heterogeneity. Uh, and so we'll have, you know, full elastic wave propagation uh, and there'll be a lot of it. In addition to that, in the intrinsic attenuation from the fluids, 
Uh, here we are with water saturation of one. So we're going to introduce CO2. Let's just follow this curve right here. You get a very substantial Q with the first 10%, but in the next 10%, it reduces until finally it goes back to the zero again. So the strange thing about this is that could well be that what we'll see is an attenuation halo around the injection system. Uh, and that's a, a phenomenon that we're going to want to uh, monitor closely. Geochemistry, there's a lot going on in geochemistry. Uh, there is no current standard practice for this. Uh, we are going to have to be working with 80-20 solutions, uh, look up tables that we think are appropriate for changes in stiffness and strength, porosity, grain contacts, dissolution. Because uh, when you dissolve the pore walls, right, then you change the porosity but not the stiffness. If you dissolve the cement, then that has that big effect. Uh, because the grains are now squeezing against each other. Cementation of the grain, right, has almost no effect. It's it's good for the stiffness uh, and precipitation on the pore walls, right? Uh, you get porosity change, but you don't get any change in the, in the seismic data. The um, challenge uh, is to try to work through different simulators uh, to make this all work. There's geology and petrophysics simulations. And of course, then the, uh, the Darcy flow simulations uh, with geochemistry added, um, the geomechanics and the geophysics simulators. Those simulators are all very different uh, and to try to go around the circle once or twice or three times, uh, there's a lot of movement of things between simulators, which generates uh, some pretty interesting uh, effects to watch out for. The, um, Geology simulators, right, like the multi-point geostatistics uh, and the Darcy flow uh, simulators and the Hooke's Law simulators for geomechanics and the wave equation don't have any parameters in common. So what we have to do is we have to move from one to the other to the other to the other uh, effectively. Now, it is possible to try to pull those together, uh, and there's some, uh, some progress being made in that, um, and we're, we're monitoring that and using the best available uh, codes available to us. Spacings are an interesting challenge. Uh, if you look at flow simulators, right, uh, they're 50 by two meters. Uh, if you look at uh, geology grids, uh, 12 and a half by two meters, seismic grids, typically 12 and a half by five, means you've got to use the smallest possible grid that's in common with those, which is like 12 and a half by two. And if you've got a flow simulator at two, million cells, the geophysical simulator is three orders of magnitude larger because not only do you have to account for the flow in the reservoir, but you have to account for everything else that's happening in the earth around it. Uh, and so scale up three orders of magnitude means a lot of compute power. And we're used to that, um, but there's a lot of money spent when we do it. So the challenges that we have to uh, work through, um, what are those, uh, those challenges uh, in simulation? Uh, we have parameters that we have to uh, work through like injectivity, bloom location and movement, the CO2 saturation and vary the injection rates. Uh, look at the structural and stratigraphic trapping. Um, take a look at the issues related to seal integrity. Uh, and then, of course, there are the issues uh, that relate to the ground movement, fault activation, and seismicity. Uh, and not to mention uh, those other things that are force based uh, the capillary patches, the solution, and the mineralization. So, all those are variables, uh, and each one of those is going to have a different effect. Uh, and we've got the opportunity now to, be able to go through the cycle and show what effect uh, each one of those has. So some of the preliminary work that's gone on is that uh, we're looking at injection of CO2 uh, in the turbinites, and you can see it's not homogeneous, and it shouldn't be. Uh, and in fact, if you break a fault and allow it to go up the fault, right, uh, you can start to see um, you can start to see what happens uh, when it uh, enters up into the upper reservoir. In addition. So the seismology, sorry, the uh, geophysics uh, monitoring that we're involved in is uh, to work through 3D and 2D uh, time surface seismic data, PNS waves, uh, simulation of 3D VSP and DAS, 
at high frequencies, uh, micro seismic monitoring at high frequencies, uh, electromagnetic and resistivity measurements at the surface, and uh, gravity, surface, and borehole. So that's a lot. Uh, and here's just an example uh, donated by Shell of some work done on just a, uh, a patch using all the receivers, but only sources all over this section. And you can see quite clearly where the reservoir is and how the rest of the uh, seismic section looks realistic, which it should, because it's modeled after uh, Gulf of Mexico's uh, geostatistical properties. And here's another example, again, donated by Shell. Uh, yeah, so this is an example of a test for uh, the size of vertical seismic profiling footprint uh, and what it's going to look like, um, uh, which is, you know, it has limits. And that being the case, you know, we can measure how limiting uh, each of the tools are. And we'll acquire 2D seismic data uh, in, over the injectors and the observation wells, uh, along with uh, DAS and VSP. And we'll also be monitoring uh, the seismology. Uh, for instance, if we set off earthquakes, uh, then we'll have a monitor well, and uh, we'll also have these uh, shallow boreholes. So we'll be able to uh, to measure that data and uh, electromagnetic methods, uh, surface, uh, CSEM sources. Um, we think we know how to go about this. We've done this a number of times, and we did this on the uh, last model we did for life of field. So the... Um, the big challenges are uh, actually quite interesting. Um, what is the sensitivity of CO2 chemistry and rock physics? Um, is it, you know, is it a big effect? Is it a small effect? Uh, something that we can measure. And uh, we're using the uh, CO2 multi-phase uh, fluids flow simulators, both geodynamics uh, and the geomechanics um, and whatever is available. Uh, so we're, we've got best in class and we're able to measure difference between those. Uh, big challenge in connecting simulators, um, flow, chemistry, mechanics, geology, and geophysics. Yeah, when you have to go from one simulator to another, it's, it's painful. Uh, we're also engaged in a study in uh, how to describe the seal characteristics and failure mechanisms of seals. Uh, it's actually quite interesting. Um, and it's a lot less clear that uh, folks have studied that very hard. Describing fault activation, um, coupling the geomechanics to the pressure, fluid and chemical changes, and the best way to simulate micro seismic. Uh, so those are all big challenges for us, uh, and we're in it. Uh, the question is also going to be, how are we going to use the deliverables? And I think it's going to be interesting because the point number one will be the accuracy of those inversions and interpretations. Uh, we've got the ground truth. Uh, and so therefore, we'll know how sharp and how good and how fast and how well those techniques uh, pick up on um, the fact that we need to monitor uh, CO2 and trapping and leakage and, um, and uh, uh, density. Uh, sensitivity to parameters, right? We can change those parameters and see how sensitive things are. Efficiency of the workflows. I think we talked a little bit about that, uh, linking those simulators, or making that go much more quickly. Testing monitor strategies in the sample. Right? How much do you need? What can you get away with? What's your demos? Uh, and of course, teaching and training, uh, which is really good because now you get demonstrably uh, show you uh, by using this information. So I think that's probably as far as I can get with this today. Uh, but I do think that if you have any questions, we'd be uh, very happy to uh, talk to you about this. Shelly Oakley is the uh, Seam Director of Operations. Mike Failer is the CO2 Project Manager. Uh, I'm working in a business development for Seam, uh, and appreciate the opportunity to be with you today to discuss our project. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, excellent presentation. and. Uh... Uh, would be very interesting work going forward. I hope it'll uh, uh, form a reference for a lot of the work on monitoring and testing different techniques and approaches to see what we can see. Um, and with that, I'd like to invite uh, all the speakers who are still online to return for the discussion part of our workshop today. And uh, all of our participants uh, who can be invited up uh, uh, one at a time to ask their questions verbally to the panelists or even to the wider discussion group. Um, 
we'll go through the questions put in the Q and R and invite each of those uh, question posers to to do just that. Um, I will start, if I may, with one that was asked a while ago. So this uh, first question uh, is uh, based on their observation, most of the CO2 injection unable to reach the simulation target, I, that is uh, one megaton per annum. Uh, is it due to the geological nature that enables uh, to meet the simulation target or mainly due to facilities limitations? So um, it looks like Phil Rigrose would like to respond to that question, but of course, uh, once he's given his answer, uh, we can discuss it more widely. Thank you, Phil. Sure, Tony, I can give a preliminary answer because it's much discussed. Uh, but for Sleipner and Snowbit in the Norwegian sector, we are, we are injecting below the target for practical reasons. That, that, you know, there's a lot of misunderstanding. Everybody says Sleipner injects a million tons per annum. That's the design plan. The reality is we've injected between 0.7 and, and 1 million ton every year. It depends on the availability of CO2. Um, so I think you have to understand that any CCS project has a design capacity and an operating injection per annum. And you have to tie in the storage, the transport and the capture into a sequence. So basically at Sleipner and Snovit, we, we store every molecule we get to store. <laughs> And I think that's true of other projects. Okay, uh, I'd, I'd actually like to pose a follow-on question to that point while we have you here on the subject. Um, uh, one thing that's not clear to me is uh, I'd imagine that the supply of CO2, especially for more third-party arranged uh, storage systems like Northern Lights, what happens if the supply of CO2 is very variable? I mean, is that damaging or undesirable to the injection performance? I mean, do you want to keep it constant or can you cope with you know, seasonal arrival of greater or lesser CO2? It's a really good question. And in a way, we haven't, we haven't answered it actively because Sleipner has a, you know, is a one-to-one -one capture thing, you know, so it's all integrated. But Northern Lights would be taking CO2 from multiple capture points. So technically there's a minimum. You, you cannot, you don't want to stop CO2 injection completely. You, you want to operate within a low and maximum uh, delivery supply. And that's one reason why the Northern Lights has installed a, uh, a, a, a receiving terminal with 12 tanks of, of CO2. So we will be able to handle the fluctuations in the supply. Uh, but if a capture plant stops completely, then yes, you would have to shut in the CO2 injection and you'd have to make moves to maintain pressure in the well to avoid uh, backflow of water or CO2 into the well. So from the storage point of view, you ideally don't want the CO2 supply to stop completely, but you can handle shut-ins for a few weeks or months, no problem. Okay, good to know. Uh, Emin, would you like to take the next question perhaps? Yeah, so um, I have a question from uh, from Q and A box, and that was from Xenia third of seven. Xenia, would you like to uh, uh, ask it uh, live, please? Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Thank you for letting to speak. The first question is more general question related to uh, CCUS as an industry. What is the most mature uh, CCUS project in the North Sea and in the world? Maybe a question that is, uh, who is who is that question addressed to? Perhaps, uh, Philip, if you want to start with, and then uh, we can. Well, I, I can start. I mean, uh, the most mature project in the North Sea is the Sleipner project, which started in 1996 and has been injecting for 26 years without interruption and continues to inject. Um, globally, uh, in North America and the United States, uh, there's an EOR project that's been injecting since, I think, 1973. Uh, uh, so that's capturing and storing the CO2 for EOR purposes. Uh, so those are the two longest running projects that I know about. Thank you. And the second question, it was related to the Green Sand uh, presentation. When we, you made the conclusion related to the two and a half thousand tons of CO2, what is the reference for? Is it ear uh, injection or... What does it mean? I it, so I just answered your, your question also in the chat. So in fact, the 2,500 tons uh, was just the reference, um, the confirmation basically between the, the model, the theoretical detection threshold 
in terms of CO2 saturation and in the you know in CO2 in this uh, simulation cell compared to the encountered or measured CO2 uh, response in the seismic. So that has nothing to do with uh, in injection rates for the full field um, development. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. Thank you, Xenia. Thank you to, for discussion. I can ask a question uh, for the C modeling. Bill, uh, was a, it's a very uh, integrated and very wide uh, application of various uh, modeling tools. Have you um, has it been tested on uh, on the fields that are injected with injecting CO2 for past uh, Schleipner or uh, or Snowit? Uh, have it, has it been tested on those fields? Uh, this modeling tool to see how how it replicates the reality. Yeah, no, uh, one of the things that uh, we are not doing, uh, I mean, is we are not replicating what you can, uh, you can get if you go to a service provider and ask them to use their best tools to do a, a digital twin for your personal field. Uh, one, of the advantage, one of the things we're doing is we're, uh, we're taking up a different space the different space we're taking up is uh, we have we are generating the ground truth, uh, and then uh, using the simulations to back calculate that uh, as an experiment. You have to take those learnings and then transport those learnings if you're going to use it in the industry. The last thing we would want to do would be in, get in direct competition with uh, with all of the service providers that uh, would like to be able to do that for you. So if you've got a field and you need work done. Uh, you find a service provider, uh, whoever it is, a big company or a small company or a major company or a big provider, right, and pay them money, uh, and they'll do that for you. Uh, we have we we have a diff, we have a completely different business model, uh, and so the answer is I'm looking forward to the day when those learnings come to bear on some of the great fields. Um, one reason I actually asked that question was because of the um, discussions in the keynote speech with uh, Philip and also presentation from uh, Andreas and Habib in terms of uh, mm -hmm. how good we should know, we should understand how we should know the reservoir before we start the injection, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, if uh, Andreas Sabados, uh, if you can remind us on the the grid cell, for example, that you're using in your modeling, to, your reservoir modeling for to get the more model right to run the simulations. Because uh, if I remember from the abstract, it was quite a small grid. So I was wondering how do you actually manage to those small grids and actually how you do you manage to put the, the parameters in those small grids, whether that was 10 meters or so, because of the heterogeneity we have in subsurface. How good is actually the description of those of the subsurface or not? What's your feeling That's on that? an excellent question. Uh, yeah. uh, we, we're using all the best tools available to us, the best knowledge, the best simulators, um, and we're generating uh, what what you cannot, you can't tell this, the data that we generated from, uh, from live data. Uh, it passes the Turing test, uh, and when it passes the Turing test, it's, it's really valuable. Uh, and we can generate it with or without noise, right? So question is, uh, if, you're, if you're developing nuclear weapons, uh, you can do field testing where you can design in the computer. If you design in the computer, it's a lot safer uh, and uh, and there's a lot more that you can get done. So we're going down that road, I mean. Um, and I perfectly understand. And it's, a, it's a very important point uh, what you make is uh, if we make all the forward simulations and make sure that uh, we have, um, we can create a size me that, uh, that, that is a reason resolvable or that represents our understanding of the, of the subsurface. Um, I wonder if um, either Philip or Andreas Sabados, if you have any re reflections from the, at least from Andreas, from the green sand uh, modeling and the monitoring tool that you. Of course, the, the question, uh, the details to the simulation model is, is very uh, key, of course. Uh, the simulation model is the backbone of, of any uh, CCS operation. And and um, this is, um, it, you, it's not you, you have been asked Pardon? Sorry, let me continue with this sentence. So basically, you have been also asking uh, grid cells and, and, and resolutions and, and so forth. So um, for the pilot injection, and, and this is a limited uh, operation, so we will not continue the, op, uh, the, the injection so far. So we have now concluded and completed the, the CO2 pilot injection. And this was based on, I think, a grid cell in the very near Valbor area of, of 10 meters. But I'm not exactly aware of, of, of these details. Um, of course, 
finally, for the full field um, a model, we need to find a good balance uh, between grid cell computation time in the in the near available area and and the the wider aquifer areas. And and of course, that is definitely be, being a, a big question uh, to solve, because we we see this uh, as a kind of recurring activity. You know, we we are planning to to have um, regular focus seismic acquisitions, and with this comes basically the planning of the subsequent seismic campaign based on the updated simulation models based on the results of the previous seismic campaign. And if you want to repeat this cycle and this recurring cycle of maintaining your, your simulation models, um, of course, uh, computation time and, and quick look implementation of, of ideas and results of the seismic monitoring is key. So um, for, for this plume migration modeling for this tiny 4,000 tons test injection, I think it's it's a limited issue, but but for full field later the day, it is definitely something to consider to to, to allow for, for an heterogenic uh, simulation model. High resolution near Velbor and near the plume migration front and a bit coarser anywhere mm -hmm. else. If Andreas, could I add something to what you're saying? <laughs> Uh, yes. Because, you know, I think it's important to what is enough. You, do, you shouldn't do overkill here. Uh, you, you are planning a relatively small pilot, so you should that probably what you did was enough. And exactly. I like to make the point that when the Sleipner project started 25 years ago, the engineers made a crude estimate for how much the plume would expand after 20 years. And they were basically right. Um, the details came later, but you can, we should ask ourselves what's good enough. Uh, to, as a forecast, and I think one of the values of monitoring is that you adjust your plan as you go in a reasonable way, uh, because it's, you know, we can't, we can't put all the technology up front and predict everything. <laughs> so yes. there has to be a discussion about what's reasonable to expect in your forecasts in the early part of a project. Agree. Yes, and, and what we see, the value of, of this focus seismic, uh, basically, apart from the fact that we have uh, spots or areas, or key areas, risk areas of permanent uh, surveillance, like uh, uh, faults, like uh, the crestal pinch out or other geologically driven risk areas um, that we identified, of course, um, this um, plume migration front, where we basically have a moving target. Um, that is what we think uh, we can basically um, uh, measure while while injecting basically the, the 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 you know the plume migration front is what we can capture with this concept, right? And that is good enough to calibrate and and to, to reassess your simulation models. Yeah, exactly. I agree. It's a good tactic. <laughs> can I ask yep. an associated um, question with that discussion as to uh, mapping that uh, CO two plume front? Um, uh, and, and I'd be interested in Bill's input on this too, since uh, he's looking at it from a different direction. But this plume front, it's not, um, it's not a clean cut boundary. Uh, how are you defining that front and what does that mean? And uh, as far as I understand it, seismic has difficulty with estimating saturation. So this front is uh, again, fuzzy in the data, I would guess. I'd, I'd be interested to hear what your commentary on that would be. It is, and like, for example, a multi-layered CO2 plume is extremely hard to image in seismic terms because you get multiple mm -hmm. and pull-down effects. Um, so I, I'm not saying that it's easy, but the thing is about CO2 is going to migrate upwards towards the top. So, mm -hmm. you know, the, the finding your critical point is really a good question because at Sleipner, the, the biggest concern is the CO2 migration at the top, which is actually very well imaged. And we can detect that down to probably a meter thickness of CO2. And we want to know if it's ever going to migrate out of the structural closure that it's currently in. So in a way, we have, you know, good imaging of the critical point. But, you know, say you were concerned about CO2 migration from a deeper layer, which you didn't have good imaging of, you know, then you would need some kind of you know, good enough monitoring that would tell you about that. Um, you know, in the Snowbit project, which is much deeper, two and a half kilometers depth, we can't mm -hmm. detect, uh, you know, we've probably five meters thickness is the detection limit. So, you know, you can't expect perfect detection, but it's still enough for you to understand how the plume is expanding. 
So it's that kind of discussion that has to go on. Yes, I, I fully agree. And, and even more, what we have been doing in, in, in Greensand, of course, is just referring to the Greensand, Greensand geology. So we have a very homogeneous reservoir. We have this kind of um, ABO effect in the oil anyway. And we have this very early um, uh, kind of um, first reversal, phase reversal and, 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 and detection evidence in the water leg where we injected the CO2. So this is, of course, all to be <laughs> um, considered uh, before, before we... So basically, if we, if we inject into the, the depleted area, we have a three-phase um, flow and, and also effects of, of oil being pushed out and, and other difficulties uh, yet to overcome. But, uh, but in the aquifer, in the green sand reservoir, where we have 20 meters of high porous, um, high permeable um, net pay, Basically, um, we, we are confident that we can detect the blue migration front by means of, of focus seismic. But that's a key yep. word, isn't it? Detection, not resolution quite yet. No, exactly. Is that correct. Okay. Yes. So it's basically an interpolation of the, so the blue migration front is not being made visible by the, by the seismic. You just have a yes or no at various locations. So you have a no yeah. CO2 outside the plume and the CO2 inside the plume. And if those two spots are close to each other, you can just interpolate the plume migration front. And that is exactly the concept. And yeah, that might be good enough, uh, depending on what the context is. Exactly. Mm. That's a great question. Uh, originally, if I remember right, Anthony, you uh, asked the question about the front. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's an interesting question because um, one of the things that I believe is appropriately understood is that the pressure moves faster than the co2 does so oh, yeah. that if you can find the pressure front and there's heterogeneity in that then that would be the leading information that would tell you that it's the see this is where the co2 is going to follow and if it's headed in the wrong direction for the wrong reason you know you'd want to get that early on so you can't drill all the wells and catch all the pressure information that way right uh, so the question is what are the techniques that you can use to capture the pressure front and how delicately it can work and whether or not uh, that has uh, the effect that you're looking for. And that's one. The other is the mechanical stress. Yeah. The mechanical stresses also uh, are going to be operating at a different time scale. Uh, and those stresses also uh, are going to be asymmetrical. Uh, and, you know, if they're doing things that you don't like uh, because uh, it's not homogeneous and it's headed in the wrong direction. You want all those precursors. So the question is, um, how do you get the uh, the how do you get to be really good at these estimations? Um, it's a really important question. The, the reason that we're trying to do numerical work is that we don't want to wait 40, 50, or 100 years to get all this experience. Uh, we want we want yeah we want to get the experience in the computer as early as quickly as possible and get it out in the public domain. Yeah, agreed. Hmm. I agree with you, Bill, and I would just do a follow-up on your pressure discussion, because if you're worried about pressure plume, the, the pressure front moving out, you know, you could put in a pressure gauge in a well or in a, in a shallow interval to confirm that there's not a problem with pressure. The Illinois Decatur project that has been injected CO2 for quite a while, they had multiple pressure gauges above the CO2 storage interval, and they could show that there was no detectable pressure change in a shallower layer. And that was a very good piece of information, you know, so that the pressure pulse has not moved up. So there, there are many things you can monitor. And the point is that if your key question is pressure or strain, then make sure you monitor that. <laughs> you know? And there are ways of doing it cost effectively. Can I add a comment on the uh, pressure fronts? Yeah, please, Wait. please go ahead. We are exactly doing that in North Dakota because we uh, installed a fiber behind the casing. Uh, it's quite sensitive. The, the fiber soon sensor can detect the small press change. So we are uh, encouraging uh, our uh, Japanese companies operators. Uh, once they do the well, just uh, install the fiber cable consists of the three uh, cables, DTS, DAS, and the DSS allow you to do the uh, uh, strain sensing and uh, acoustic sensing and uh, temperature sensing. 
uh, we, we call this a, a multiple sensor can help uh, the operator reduce the cost. The most important one is because uh, uh, we can uh, acquire the data real time. That's allowed the, the operator to make decision, real time decision, and also can help the operator to optimize the, the injection uh, strategy. Thank you. Uh, we have, uh, thank you for a good discussion. And um, we also have a couple of other questions, but we maybe we, we first can bring Roya. Uh, she had her hand up. Uh, whether you, Roy, you would like to ask a question live. Yeah, I have uh, two questions. One of them is about uh, the same modeling that uh, um, we presented. Uh, I think this, I want to elaborate on the benefit of these models, but it's important that we we have a system to uh, calibrate these models with the real cases. I think uh, these models are very good to test the leakage scenarios. We don't want to test the, these leakage scenarios on the real cases. But uh, these uh, settings uh, would be a good uh, kind of um, uh, benchmark to see if uh, there is any leakage and uh, how, how this happens and what are the uh, criteria for this to happen, how we can monitor these small, teeny leakages, for example, into overburden. But to be able to rely on the results from these leakage test scenarios, then we need to be able to calibrate these models with the real cases. And as uh, Bill mentioned, uh, for example, um, the case that uh, any new brought up that if they have tried it on a slider and they propose to, to go to the vendors to do these things, I, I would like that uh, these cases, the real cases would be applied on these same models that we can calibrate and see how much we can rely on the results from these models if they are applicable on the uh, real situation when we need them. I hope I was clear in explaining the, the comment. Uh, I don't know if you have, uh, Bill, if you have any uh, reply to that. I, I think you made one interesting point that I wanna reinforce, which is if you're going to try to find out what tools are best for detecting uh, failure, it's better to do that in a computer than it is in the mm -hmm. field. Um, that's, you know, that's, yeah, I, I'll just draw the line there. Thank you. Um, do you have another question, uh, Roya? It, um, it, it is right. Yeah. Please. Yeah. So the second question is about, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, benefit of micro seismic or passive seismic monitoring for CCS application. Uh, I think this is a technology that comes in the last in our monitoring list because when we detect any earthquakes, it's kind of uh, too late. We need to shut down. This is a kind of last action that we need to do. And uh, But I see that there are potentials in this technology. And my question is to Andreas and uh, uh, Shigu to see how we can push this technology to make it, uh, to bring it up in our monitoring list. Is it with the uh, uh, advancing data analysis, or it's with advancing the acquisition technologies, is it with uh, more local uh, monitoring uh, system, or is it with uh, expanding the data coverage area? What, what can be uh, uh, developed in this area to make this technology more useful for CCS uh, monitoring? Is Andreas going to take that one? Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay, so so in in, in fact, um, yeah, um, we we need to be a bit careful. So it is uh, the regulator, of course, also has a saying, and um, and it is it is clear that uh, we we are going to disseminate our results as this is a research uh, consortium and co-funded by the Danish um, research uh, funding authority UDP, um, and. Um, and of course, we can only talk about you know the results based on 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 the Nini um, best uh, segment. So it, as I mentioned before, it is always important to be in mind that um, that the subsurface defines uh, basically the the, the 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 physics. So with this regard to to the um, motivation, uh, I, I mentioned in my my talk that the overall goal. I mean, we, we all know. Um, CCS will not be accepted by by or will very costly if if we and of course the CO2 efficiency is also relevant so we need to bring down the environmental footprint and and going out for for a 40 a seismic campaign um, every three four years or so this is what we wanted to question 
Uh, this is the conventional technology. So we know basically uh, how to do it if, if we are not wanting to do research. But again, it's a question of concept and philosophy, whether you, you want to shrink your monitoring um, measurement to a level that really allows you to take the conclusions for the questions you have, or you always want to have a full image, a full subsurface understanding based on 3D seismic. And this is what we question, in fact, um, that obtaining a full, fully migrated 3D um, map view of the subsurface is not always the, the right way to go. And this is um, what I think um, here, the starting point of, of course, um, of this discussion, of course, 3D seismic is still a very important verification measure. I, we are not saying that we have been overcoming 3D seismic and you need 3D seismic in any case um, as, a, as a backbone of, of, of your understanding of the reservoir. So you will need to have 3D seismic in any case. But if you have a simple plume, a, a simple geology, homogeneous reservoir, and the plume is modeled to be migrating um, in a very, yeah, let's say normal way uh, so that you can rely on, on basically, and you, you evidence your, your, your um, confidence in, in your plume modeling by a regular measurement. Um, with this, we think um, that there is a big running room to, to, to really reduce um, 40 seismic efforts to a minimum. Yeah. Uh, Andreas, thank you very much to having your perspective on this uh, question. But I went mostly toward the passive application that uh, uh, Andreas from Nursa presented. I can, oh, there is Andreas coming? Yeah, hi, Andreas, go ahead. Uh, um, yeah, I'm still here, but I didn't, uh, yeah. I was suspecting maybe I could be meant, but then I was not sure. Okay, yeah, so so this, uh, Philip, you can, you can add to this um, uh, if you want, but I, I think we, in this project that we have demonstrated, we found that um, that using these data sources, offshore data sources, is very useful. And, and it, I think it doesn't take, on the processing, data processing side, it doesn't take so much more development to use these data sources. It's more more a practical side, how uh, how much, how many offshore centers can, can we afford to install and Thank you, Philip. You also mentioned earlier that they should not maybe put thousands of sensors there, but really think about what is the most efficient way of, of uh, monitoring. And we explored this a bit also in the in the project with using single nodes and just a selection of uh, sensors from the sea floor and so forth. But uh, I, I agree with you, Andreas. And we should add that passive seismic listening is not nearly as expensive as time-lapse seismic. So it's, it's a cheap technology in general. Uh, mm. but the challenge for the offshore is, is what listening do we need and to try and get it up the, the priority list, you know? Uh, and it's much better to prevent than to cure. So I think it's important to have some passive seismic listening early on in the project, which is what we're trying to do offshore Norway. Uh, mm. Initially, we, we thought of having very expensive seabed uh, node systems, but then we focused on cost-effective <laughs> solutions, which was quite good. And the really exciting cost-effective solution that's emerging is fiber optic sensing. You know, if we can use downhole fiber optic and surface fiber, you can get very good uh, passive seismic monitoring. Uh, so you maybe can just have a few nodes, uh, broadband nodes and lots of fiber would be a very cost-effective way of monitoring micro-seismicity. I'd like to get back to what uh, Bill was talking about a bit earlier, that um, the really nice early warning and indication would be that pressure front rather than the higher saturation uh, CO2 front. And uh, I, I, it's probably not answerable right now, but uh, hopefully the seam modeling might be able to, in that uh, that pressure front presumably produces some density changes. and I, would wonder if they're detectable by 4D gravity and wonder if they're detectable even by a heave of the, the, the seabed as well. So the pressure surely uh, do, uh, unleashes some geomechanical changes. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, actually, uh, there's something else also that may happen. It, it turns out that the pressure front, we've seen this a couple of different times. There's a really nice example of when the pressure front goes through, 
you believe that you know you've got this wonderful saline aquifer but all it takes is just a little bit of dissolved gas in there and the free gas and you can be, you can actually drive the free gas into that and wind up with a, a, a pressure front yeah you can monitor the pressure front based on the uh, non-perfect saline fluids uh yeah i could show you a paper that you would be really surprised at um but yeah you can see the you can see the pressure point you know right away and sure enough it's asymmetrical and sure enough that's you know that's where the that's where the action in the reservoir goes uh, but that was that was oil and gas work um yeah. but yeah i mean you know the aquifer itself is not necessarily you know pure Perfect. salt water yeah mm -hmm. so you know some sometimes you get unlucky or lucky depending upon how you look at it but yeah, you can sometimes see it. But the other technique, the question is, can you see that through realistic activities? Can we generate, you know, two kilometers above? Right? How are we going to monitor far enough away, two kilometers above? What's going on down there, two kilometers below? With what tools? Yeah. And can you really afford it? And, you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because uh, to my mind, at least, uh, things like 40 gravity or the passive seismic uh, they're, they're passive, so they're the least impact environmentally and uh, presumably the cheapest to way to monitor and maybe even continuously. In, in fact, in the uh, in same, in same flow of the question, because we are discussing various applications of this focus seismic monitoring and uh, the, also the gravity uh, monitoring or um, the dust and PRM uh, path monitoring. Uh, or the, with the sensor for micro system. But what about the integration, right? So how do we plan to integrate yeah. various activities into uh, monitoring? So what what are we doing on that? So I presume that some the same teams are working on the various, or is it like within companies, are we looking at the different teams are integrated into one uh, general effort to understand, to combine the different ob uh, observations into one, uh, into one understanding, or how is it happening? Or how do you see that happening? Yeah, you know, one thing, I, it's a hard question to answer, I mean, but uh, there is work on joint uh, physics inversion. So you can jointly invert gravity data, EM data, and seismic data. So it's an interesting thing to do, <laughs> but very, very complicated. And I, I think my main point would be it's, you know, we're talking very much geophysics here, but don't forget the other physics, which is fluid physics. And there the reservoir engineering community have a lot to offer because if you can detect so much using either time-lapse seismic or micro-seismic or say gravity data, you wanna know what you're trying to detect. And therefore you need a high resolution flow model to say, well, what pressure pulse would I expect? And for example, in the Northern Lights project, they have predicted the seafloor heave due to the CO2 injection in phase one. And it's absolutely tiny. It's, it's a millimeter or two at, at the most and probably not detectable. Uh, so it's not something to focus on. Uh, in, in an onshore site where you don't have vegetation, you could maybe use INSAR data to get you very good ground heave estimation. So, you know, it's a very complex problem, but I think uh, I think Bill was making the point of using digital models. I think it, it's quite a good one because you, you want to try and forecast what you expect to happen and then say which monitoring technique will give you those insights. Um, and I, I think you'll find one. <laughs> um, that's that is that's a good point, and uh, that's also about uh, the cost effectiveness of the process of monitoring solution for CCS in the future. Um, that's the key uh, key here. Uh, do you have any reflections on that from uh, Ziki from Japan? So you've discussed the uh, dust and uh, and uh, seismic monitoring, but is, are there any any input from that? Uh, no, we we haven't any project uh, using dust like right now in Japan, but, uh, but I think in the near future, uh, because the government uh, requires us to uh, achieve the cost reduction at least 20%, I think uh, we, can, we can challenge many technologies like uh, uh, micro seismic, uh, passive seismic, because in Japan, we have a lot of earthquakes allowed us to do passive seismic imaging. We, we did it, we did it do, uh, we have completed a small 
uh, surveys in uh, in North Ireland as a Tomokomai project because there are a lot of earthquakes. It seems you can get some images uh, based on the passive uh, seismicities. But the problem is, what do you want to know? If you want to, uh, if you want to uh, understand the CO2 uh, plume or the CO2 uh, leakages, uh, I think uh, you, you can choose the, the tools from the toolbox to fit the wheels for the, the, for the purpose. Not, not everything uh, works well. It's, uh, I think uh, we learned a lot of, of, about the earthquake issues and uh, passive seismics. Uh, it seems even you use uh, DAS, but you only have one corpon component. It's, you have other issues. No. Uh, yeah. So that's why we are working with uh, overseas uh, institutes to demonstrate the, the, the technology and to improve the understanding how the technique can be and work where, uh, how can fit the purpose. Until this, our uh, discussion continues. Yep, yeah, please. If, if anyone's uh, still interested in the press front, they see it from back in here, several slides to tell you what can, what can we have done uh, in lab to image the uh, press front this, and, uh, and uh, the CO2 plum front, just a few slides. Uh, we use X-ray, a medical X-ray CT scanner, and they will put the core samples inside the scanner because the, uh, we can use the scanner to image the sealed plume. And that we also wrap the fiber cable, the fiber, bare fiber on the, the sandstone sample uh, yeah. to find out the press front. So let's move to the next one. So we selected a very unique sample here with, with cold part and the, uh, and the fine green part. So from the CT image, you can find a difference between left and the right. And here showing the, uh, the porosity. So we use this sample to, to yeah, visualize how CO2 accumulate in the pores, in the coarse green, how the fine green part uh, plays a low as the cap rock system. Uh, here's some uh, CO2 accumulations in the reservoir part. You can find clearly uh, in the number four, you can find the boundary between the left and the right because the right hand is a fine grain place, exact place as low as, uh, as a cap rock, uh, physically stop the CO2 uh, migrating to the right hand. Then we look at the uh, CO2 saturation along the co sample in this uh, string, estimated from the fiber uh, optic sensing. You can find its, its saturation profile. It's quite similar with uh, stream profile. And then uh, we move to the next one to look at the, the uh, beyond the 40 millimeters. From the sealed saturation profile, uh, we can find it aft. Beyond the 50 millimeters, the sealed saturation is nearly zero. But look at the stream, stream profile. You can find the stream up to uh, 30 or 40 micro streams. That's clearly. Seat plume is here, front is here, but the, uh, the string, uh, the press front is part of, is almost five millimeters away from the front. So with that, mm -hmm. we, in the near future, we can we can do simulation if you have the if we have the uh, hydrodynamic property, uh, we can do the simulation to uh, to estimate how far the front the press front is uh, uh, away from the, the seat front. Uh, that's uh, what we, we are doing in Austria, Try to check it as I did. Yeah, Shigo, may I ask if this pressure front is uh, capable of uh, reactivating the fog or it needs to, uh, it needs you to, to reach the fog to reactivate the fog? Yes, yeah, yeah. So Which in terms of it? the, in terms of reactivate, reactivation of the fault system, I believe the first thing we need to understand what is the current stress condition of the fault, because people always talk talking about you have uh, if I, you have big pressure build up, they may cause earthquakes. But the the I think the truth uh, is if the if the fault is under critical condition, even a small uh, pressure build up can also can cause the reactivation. 
That's why we propose to use a string, the fiber string sensing to look at the, the, uh, the fault condition and then monitor the, the stress accumulation or the string accumulation along the fault. Uh, it can help us to understand that once the, the pressure to reach the, the fault and the, how the fault reactive to, reactive to the pressure uh, uh, front. Well, we've been working with uh, uh, Austrian side for a couple of years to, to dig into the more deeper. Thank you. Please go ahead. Hey, hello. Thank you, first of all, for, the, uh, for this opportunity. So I'm really keen, actually, to see the next generation of SIM modeling. And uh, I've seen a couple of good slides opening uh, uh, to an opportunity, actually, uh, to integrate more methodologies non-seismic methods like EM and again, potential field methods. So my question was actually, can we simulate the density changes uh, to, to understand the sensitivity of, uh, in this case, uh, gravimetry to that type of changes in the, at the level of a reservoir, but even on the overboard and underboard and uh, uh, deformation and et cetera. So that was in a nutshell, uh, my uh, my question uh, and already uh, uh, William answered. So if you can build a, a little bit more on the plan that you have uh, uh, with the next generation of scene modeling to integrate more domains. Well, the question you ask is, uh, will there be changes that could be uh, monitored with gravity? Uh, and that depends uh, entirely upon how big those changes are and where the gravity measurements are. The biggest problem, of course, is that if the gravity measurements are so far away from the action and the, and the effects are small, then it's very difficult uh, to get the sensitivity we're looking for. But um, you calculate, we know what the calculations are like, right? Uh, and yeah, the, it's there, right? The density calculations exist. Uh, the question is going to be, are you going to need to be close to borehole gravity to get it? Or, you know, how far away can you measure it? Um, it's an excellent question, uh, but yes. And the same is true with electromagnetics. If you think about it, right? If you were able to take an observation well, right? And put sensors in there uh, and then do surface sources into the, uh, into the borehole or vice versa, right? Then you can have a whole different way of trying to work through uh, the question of where the saturation is. Much better than you could if you were able to get, you know, the sort of seismology that we're used to using. So, um, yeah, we can do the calculations and then set up the uh, the, the pseudo field experiments uh, and then ask the question, how sensitive does it have to be? What kind of sampling do you need to have? How important is it to combine things? Do you need a little bit of gravity and a little bit of electromagnetics, a little bit of seismic to make sense out of it? Uh, or, you know, are they standalone effects? And uh, there's, there's enough questions that um, we, we got to get through it. We need a benchmark data set to answer those questions. That's that's our that's our biggest need right now. I see quite a lot of values integrating a, a surface to borrow information. So, and I wonder if you are going to uh, simulate uh, the response of uh, any density changes uh, at those levels, both on the surface but also on uh, on the closest um, borrow. Yeah, well, the changes uh, are going to be calculated everywhere. The question is going to be where you put your sensors uh, and whether those sensors are sensitive enough to pick up the changes you're looking for and when, right? It's, a, it's a, partly it's a question of where, but it's also a question of when. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, so we've done, uh, we, we sorry, we've done gravity and magnetic and electromagnetic work before in our C model work, and we've used that. Um, with trying to find the edges of salt domes through multi-physics inversions. Uh, and it's been very insightful and very entertaining and very useful, right? And uh, the good news is you got the ground truth, so you know when you're right and you know when you're wrong. Um, that helps a lot. That's right. Thank you. So I hope that answers your question, Stefano. Uh, and um, 
Bill might be a bit angry with me, but I did some back of the envelope calculations and I think it will be sensitive at surface, but we'll, we'll see when the real results come out. Yes. Uh, I was just gonna add one comment to that discussion is that one thing we've learned at Sleipner is that the thermal effect on the density changes is very important. So yes. a lot of the first round modeling was isothermal and my reservoir engineering friends have shown me that you really need non-isothermal. So a fully coupled thermal modeling of the CO2 plume to get the density correct. So if you're trying to estimate your gravity response, ironically, you need to have a good temperature model. <laughs> so, yeah. But uh, Phil, that was because um, at Slatner you were injecting uh, somewhat shallower compared to some yes. of these other projects. Uh, shallow uh, injection, so the CO2 is cooling as it goes up through the uh, formation. Yeah. It might go in the opposite direction if you're injecting below two kilometers, if I understand correctly. Correct. correct. But the, the overall learning is that the thermal effect of CO2 migrating in the storage domain is quite important. And in, in reservoir oil and gas, we've tended to ignore thermal mm. effects unless you work in steam flooding. Uh, mm. So, you know, you, you have to think about several aspects of this problem. And uh, there's also the geomechanical response. So. It's a little bit more challenging, but than than some some classical oil and gas problems. Yeah, I, I'm neck deep in equations of state right now. I understand what you mean. Good. Philip, we are measuring the the temperature profile in our structure along the injection wire uh, because they also inject cold CO two. Mm -hmm. uh, the temperature gap is around the 10, more than 10 degrees C. Uh, we have another five to check to check the uh, to the, check the geomechanical response. Right now, we don't see any problems, but we can say we combine DTS with DSS. Uh, it's perfect to tell you the well integrated and also the caprock integrated. We we are working on this issue because sometimes they they stop CO2 injection, then the temperature going up, then we start CO2 injection, the temperature going down. So we have a lot of chance to learn uh, from DTS and the DSS to tell the operator how the wear integrity, uh, the the wear integrity is aware or not. It's good chance to learn from yeah. the five of yeah, That's good to hear and e yes. excellent. Yeah. So we can use temperature monitoring from fiber as well. <laughs> yes, yes, because yeah. you, you can put the three or four fibers just in one one quarter inch stainless tube. It, it's easy. Uh, you, then you can uh, measure the, the profile. Yeah. Um, we're closing down to three o'clock in Norwegian time. Or and I would like to say thanks uh, from on behalf of or, or organizers. This was a very interesting session and very, very interesting presentations and uh, discussion. Uh, we discussed uh, the monitoring solutions, various monitoring solutions, uh, examples, and also modeling solutions. And of course, we had a nice, uh, interesting, um, informative uh, key, keynote speech uh, up front. Uh, what I would like to to invite Adriana uh, to tell us about the day two of the conference, of the workshop, which will be tomorrow. Please, Adriana. Yes, thank you. So again, well, thank you to the speakers that had the presentations today and to Emin and Anthony for sharing the session. So tomorrow we have a uh, continuation of the workshop. And the idea is to start with presentations that will be covering CO2 composition, transport, and imp impact on infrastructure, as well as monitoring of infrastructure. Uh, that's the first part. And we have uh, very good speakers I will share. So we, we have a, a very good speaker. So the first session, as I said, is on infrastructure monitoring CO2 comp composition with Monica Sigrid Franke, Gareth Hintz, and Marcel Grubert. And then we will follow up that with a more high level overview of carbon capture and sequestration. And we're gonna delve onto the business context as well. In that one, we will have presentations from Will Bradbury, Anders Nerman, Kirsten Hubbard, Christopher Engenes, Michael Wine, and Per Olof Granstam. So yeah, we're looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. And thank you very much for today. Thank you very much, I'm closing. Bye-bye. Thank you. See you. Thank you. Bye-bye.